one of the um, things that, that we realized as an organizing committee was that over the past several years, though it's not been specifically highlighted, uh, the topic of aging in stem cells um, has really sort of been a theme throughout many talks uh, over the past several years, and so we wanted to specifically highlight that this year um, with speakers that could comment, say, on um, tools and techniques that are, are used in aging research uh, and how those tools then can be used to understand fundamental things about our, our basic biology of stem cells and, and ultimately then to translate those into um, a variety of different systems. So um, our first speaker today uh, comes to us from the Scripps Research Institute. Uh, it's Eros Denke. He's uh, an assistant professor there who comes to us by way of uh, a PhD at the Open University of London and a postdoctoral fellowship at Rockefeller. He's been here since 2009 and will tell us a lot about his uh, recent work uh, published in Science, and, or, I'm sorry, in Cell and, and Nature. So uh, with that, I'll turn things over. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you so much for the organizers to giving me the opportunity to tell you something about our research on the connection between telomeres uh, and uh, tissue regeneration and so aging. So basically, so we, we study a very basic uh, problem, which is how cells maintain the telomeres and what is the connection with um, aging and tissue regeneration. And so basically this, okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so the first evidence that there was a link between um, telomeres, or at least something inside the cells, and the ability of cells to proliferate came from the experiment in the 60s from AFLIC, the so-called AFLIC limit. And basically, this observation was before we knew that telomeres even existed, and showed us that if you place human cells in culture, they have a limited lifespan. So they can divide a certain amount of time, and then eventually they will die. And then later on, we appreciated what was the molecular mechanism for this. And these had to do with the so-called end replication problem. So any organism like us with a linear chromosome is unable to fully replicate the end, uh, the end of a chromosome. And this leads to shortening at every single cellular division. And so loss or potentially loss of uh, genomic information at the very end of the chromosomes. Um, so if we plotted, if we could see in the experiment that AFLIC did, uh, chromosome ends, so the telomeres, the lens of telomeres, we would see that in the beginning of the cultures, cells would have very long and healthy telomeres, and within time, when they started to slow down, they would have critically short telomeres, and therefore would die. And so now there is a lot of evidence showing that the, way, the reason why these cells die is because of telomere attrition. Uh, so we all also know what is the way, in, the way in which cells deal with this problem. It's, the, it's an enzyme called telomerase, which is able to bind to chromosome ends and counteract the loss of information by synthesizing new TTHGG repeats. So there is only two things that I want to highlight uh, about telomerase in this talk. Telomerase is not expressed in any of our somatic cells. It's actually expressed at very low levels in some stem cells. And telomeres shorten with age. So if we take old people, they have shorter uh, telomeres in, in the tissue that have been analyzed. So this led to a, a theory for telomeres and aging. Okay? So in this patient here, we can see the chromosome ends are very healthy. So this is basically the telomere, and it's functional. But with age, uh, the use of laces leads to erosion of telomeres, and therefore loss of functionality. Of course, as you can see, this patient has a lot of other defects. So I'm not saying that telomeres are the only reason why the shoe became old, but it could be one contributing factor. However, there is both pro and against um, evidence suggesting that telomeres do play a physiological role in human aging. So in favor of uh, a role for telomere erosion, are a rare disease called dyserathrosis congenita. This is basically a disease in which patients have very short telomeres and have a defect in maintaining their highly proliferating tissues. In addition to this, there is uh, evidence from the CDV lab showing us that with, in old people or primates, uh, or monkeys, sorry, you can see signs of telomere dysfunction. But against this, there is like a very obvious um, evidence against a theory for aging, in, I mean, for telomere dysfunction and aging, is the fact that mice have very long telomeres, they have telomeres on all the time, but they live only three years. Uh, and moreover, if you take a telomerase knockout, these mice have no phenotype, you need to interbreed knockouts for five or six generations before you see any phenotype. So this would argue that clearly organisms can die because of other reasons, not only because of telomere dysfunction. And there is also a different problem just to understand 
in using mice, how telomere dysfunction can potentially affect aging. And this is the fact that telomeres are really long in a mouse and telomerase knockout is not a very good model. So we really wanted to, to find a way in which we could model telomere dysfunction in vivo and see what happens to study to see if there was any consequence. And so we took advantage of work that we did and mainly that the Lange lab did and other labs, which basically showed us that what is important about telomeres is not the sequence itself, it's not the TTA, GGG repeats, it's not the DNA, but it's this DNA is simply a binding platform for a protein complex that sits at chromosome ends and protects the chromosomes. So using the same analogy that I used before, this protein complex is basically the plastic that caps the very end of our laces. So if you remove this protective plot, even if the sequence is still there, the functionality is gone. And this is indeed the case. I'll show you just one example of this. These are uh, chromosome spreads from mouse and fibroblasts that we grow in culture. This is the way a normal chromosome should look like. The green dots are telomeres. These mice are conditional for a factor called TRF2, which binds to the chromosome ends. If we remove TRF2, that's the only thing that we do to these cells, we a single cell cycle. You can see that now the chromosomes are all glued together. And this is basically what is happening in these cells. We remove the cap, and these telomeres become dysfunctional. Cells think that this is a DNA damage site and just fuses all the chromosomes together and forms this sort of spaghetti phenotype, as I call it. OK, so basically we have now a model to test what is the consequence, what happens when you have telomere dysfunction. So with great disappointment, the first experiment that I did was to remove TRF2 in the liver of a mouse. So these mice were fully functional. So you can wait, you can age the mice for a year. Mice have totally normal liver function, even if they have basically spaghetti, all the chromosomes have fused together. Uh, not only these hepatocytes were fully viable, but you can even trick the system by pushing them into S phase by doing partial epitectomy. And again, TRF2 deficient uh, hepatocytes as well as TRF2 proficient hepatocytes can, do, can go into S phase showing that there is no signs of uh, senescence, and they can also gain mass. So they can basically make up for the lost mass. So this is telling us that at least in hepatocytes, telomere dysfunction, even to the high degree that I'm inducing here, does not cause any impairment of tissue regeneration, if you want to call it like this, uh, regeneration of the liver. However, of course, the liver, it's a very peculiar, hepatocytes are very peculiar cell type, so we, uh, we were not going to just ditch totally this uh, Theory, and we just wanted to see in different systems where telomere dysfunction could have any effect. So we used a very brutal uh, approach, which was basically use a mouse in which every single cell can, potential, can express CRE, but is in an inactive form. So we crossed the TRF2 conditional knockout mice to this mouse, and then when mice were adult, we just injected with tamoxifen, and this leads to, depending on the dose of tamoxifen that we give, to different degree of deletion, so telomere dysfunction. So I'll show you first what happens when you give a high dose, so basically a, almost a complete addition in certain uh, tissue. So these are control mice, and you can see they are viable. The scale here is seven days. If we inject uh, TR2 conditional knockout mice with tamoxifen, within seven days the mice are dead. And we have a very good idea on why these mice die. There seems to be attrition in any proliferate tissue. So for instance, if we, took a, if we look at bone marrow, you can see this spaghetti phenotype. So there is all the... Uh, telomere dysfunction phenotype. There is lower counts of uh, hematopoietic figures in, in these mice. And I think one of the most striking effects, if you look at a, a highly proliferating tissues as, such as the small intestine, this is a control mice where you see all the nice villi. Within seven days upon tr to deletion, the villi is basically shattered uh, and there's basically loss of functionality. So this is all good. This is what we expected. So in a way, it was rewarding thinking that, okay, telomeres do have a function in vivo. But I think the most interesting experiment for me was when we did a low dose. So this is a very low degree of deletion between 5% or less, depending on the tissue type. Within seven days, the mice were fully viable, regardless of the phenotype, of the genotype, sorry. But when we aged the mice, if we waited around three months, you can see that the TRF2 uh, mice started to show some shine of aging. So the grain, hunched back, and eventually they, would, they died uh, way earlier than the controls. So I, we thought that this was interesting because now it gives us a genetic tool to try and see what tissues are potentially interesting uh, causing this phenotype. And so now we're doing a set of uh, tissue-specific deletion of TRF2 to see what is the critical tissue. And maybe next time, see you, I'll have more data on this. But, so one thing that to me was very fascinating about this is that, so I showed you that you can have 
deletion in some cells and give you a very strong phenotype, but in hepatocyte, there is absolutely no phenotype. So this is telling us that cells, depending on the cell type, they can have a very different response to telomere dysfunction. So I'll show you one example of this that I think is even more striking. And the reason we started doing this was there were some links that we couldn't really understand between telomere dysfunction and brain function. So the most, uh, most obvious was a very severe type of uh, dyskeratosis congenita. So these, again, are patients with short telomeres due to defect in the telomerase component. And so these patients uh, die very early in, in uh, life. And one of the striking phenotypes, together with all what you expect in terms of regenerative tissue, they have a really small um, cerebellum. And this was not, to me, it was not very clear since there's not so many divisions that a brain needs to make compared to the rest of the body. So why was there this very striking phenotype? And the telomerase knockout cannot really tell us anything about this phenotype because the mice become sterile before their telomeres in the brain become short enough. So we used our models to induce telomere dysfunction in the brain. And so we used two different models. So the first one is a nesting tree. This is eating progenitor neurons. And the second one is a DCX grid. So these are both constitutive tree lines, and we're eating potentially the same cell type, but just at two different stages. So progenitor cells or migrating differentiating neurons. Um, and we use two models for telomere dysfunction. The first one is the TRF2, spaghetti phenotype that I told you before. The second one is a milder one, but it induces the same phenotype. It's just not as severe, which is called POT1 deletion. And so immediately, it's striking that the phenotype was very different. So when we removed TRF2 using the nesting tree, we could never, so this is now a year and a half of breeding, we never got a single viable TRF2 nesting tree. However, uh, we got this totally expected Mendelian ratio of TRF2 DCX tree. And I'll show you some data about these mice afterwards. The POT1 was very interesting because we could get some POT1 nesting mice, sub Mendelian ratio, but we could get a number of these mice. And again, the DCX was totally fine. So I'll show you the phenotype of the uh, POT1, if I can. So these mice is a, oh, sorry, it's really dark, but basically this is a POT1 nesting mouse, and there's going to be a, a little main control running around. I have to actually grab him and keep him around. So these are. Sorry, it's really dark, but 16-day-old mice. And you can see this mouse has a very severe ataxic phenotype. He has trouble coordinating the mice. And there is clearly a very severe defect in the brain, but especially in the cerebellum. Uh, and interesting, we could rescue all of this phenotype by just removing P53, which is the main signaling pathway that leads from DNA damage activation of telomeres to the fat in cellular. And we could fully rescue the viability as well as the cerebellum phenotype. So last piece of data that I'll show you has to do with the TRF2 DCX. So this is the mice where we can induce massive level of telomere dysfunction. We're doing it in the old brain. And we have evidence. I'm not going to go into technical detail here. But we, can, we cannot do metaphase spreads because these are neurons that are not dividing. But we have good evidence that these, all of the neurons here are fused. So they all show the expected telomeric phenotype. These mice are as, are as smart as the next mouse. So they can see. They can look around. You can do a lot of tests. And the only difference, the only effect that we see, the only defect that we saw in these mice is the novel object test, which is basically a test that measures the ability of mice of taking in the context of new memory. Uh, and so sure enough, when we went to see what the region of the brain that is uh, potentially responsible for storing or uh, acquiring this um, information, the denta gyrus, we could see that while in the control mouse, the denta gyrus appeared normal. In the TRF2 DCX mice, there was a very severe aglioplastic uh, uh, denta gyrus. And this was correlated with massive activation of DNA damage, such as P53 activation. And this, I want to stress, this is a mouse that is four months old. So this is an ongoing process. Uh, and so we really don't understand at this point why, since we deleted it, the rest of the brain was totally fine. We deleted TRF2 in the old brain, and we see a very specific phenotype only in this region. Uh, and it would be, I think, in the future to understand why the same sort of signal gives two very different phenotypes. So in conclusion, I just want to say that basically there is some evidence of both POT1 and TRF2 um, using both uh, POT1 and TRF2 to induce telomere dysfunction. We can see evidence for telomere dysfunction playing a role in aging or at least in uh, tissue regeneration. However, there's clearly something that we don't understand and how cell can react to the same stimulus. And I think using different three specific lines and uh, inhibiting downstream effector of the telomere dysfunction would be important to understand why there is this different effect. And with this, I'll stop, and I just want to thank 
funding agency and Charlie, which is an undergrad that did all the fantastic work that I've shown you in view. Uh, thank you very much.